Hello, it's Joe Simhart here again to talk about something uh, out of a fairy tale and maybe something that relates to reality. Uh, we've been talking a lot about cults in the news lately because of the QAnon phenomena and other political things. But um, So I'm going to concentrate on Alice in Wonderland in this particular talk. This painting above me is a quote from the Hatter in Alice, and he asks this riddle, why is a raven like a writing desk? And so as an artist, I solved the riddle. I made the raven into a writing desk and put a writing feather on its back and so forth. So artists can play with reality and uh, answer absurd questions. But we're going to look at this mushroom that comes up in Alice in Wonderland and the symbolism behind that and and what this could possibly mean um, in terms of making choices about reality. One of the finest books I've read uh, that breaks down and deconstructs Alice in Wonderland and other uh, Lewis Carroll books like Through the Looking Glass is by Martin Gardner and it's called The Annotated Alice. It's a fun read, you'll learn a lot. It's just full of interesting information by Martin Gardner, and I'll put it in my uh, notes for this segment. So let's get to the mushroom bit. Uh, here's a, one of the early illustrations of the uh, story with Hookah the caterpillar sitting on the mushroom and Alice's eyes peeking over it. Um, so in this particular uh, scene, um, Huka asks her, who are you? And also advises her that she could um, take uh, one side of the mushroom or the other side of the mushroom to make herself larger or smaller. And of course, this is confusing because there is no side to this mushroom. It's just there and round and, and Alice just spreads her arms out and picks off a piece and another piece and one side makes her smaller, one side makes her larger. And she plays with this throughout uh, the story. Uh, so what um, Gardner points out is that uh, this phrase, who are you, comes from something. I mean, Lewis Carroll didn't just make all this up. He was commenting on his culture back in the 19th century. So he says here, Fred Madden in Jabberwocky uh, calls attention to a chapter titled Popular Follies of Great Cities in Charles McKay's classic work, Extraordinary Popular Delusions in the Madness of Crowds, 1841. And we're going to talk about this book. Excellent read. Again, written 150 years ago or more. Um, and McKay tells of various catchphrases which sprang up suddenly in London. One such phrase was, who are you? Spoken with emphasis on the first and last words, it appeared suddenly like a mushroom. One day it was unheard, unknown, uninvented. The next day it pervaded London. Every new corner into an alehouse tap room was asked unceremoniously, who are you? All right, so these catchphrases spring up. I mean, we, you know, know of Ayn Rand and her catchphrase, who is John Galt? And uh, it became almost a rallying cry among conservatives lately. Um, but in her novel, Atlas Shrugged, it also became one of these catchphrases that sprung up in London back in the 18... Uh, 30s and 40s. So turning to McKay, Charles McKay, and, and again in this book, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, this is the reference that Gardner uh, is, is talking about. And some of the catchphrases that McKay brings up were things like flared up, uh, something called um, uh, par excellence, uh, there he goes out with his eye out, and uh, there she goes with her eye out. Uh, these are phrases that just sprung out all over London, not because of an internet, 
but because of word of mouth. And the internet is really another way of uh, um, spreading things through word of mouth. It just happens to be typed and spread through a different technology than talking in taverns and uh, coffee shops. You know, another phrase was, what a shocking bad hat. Uh, so anyway, he um, goes on here and he says, when this phrase had numbered its appointed days, um, it died away like its predecessors. And who are you reigned in its stead. This new favorite, like a mushroom, seems to have sprung up in a night or like a frog in Cheapside to have come down in a sudden shower. One day it was unheard, unknown, uninvented. The next it pervaded London. Every alley resounded with it. Every highway was musical with it. And he says, and street to street and lane to lane flung back the one unvarying cry, who are you? The phrase was uttered quickly and with a sharp sound upon the first and last words, leaving the middle one little more than an aspiration. Like all its compeers, which had been extensively popular, it was applicable to almost every variety of circumstance. The lovers of a plain answer to a plain question did not like it at all. Insolence made use of it to give offense, ignorance to avoid exposing itself, and waggery to create laughter. Every newcomer into an alehouse tap room was asked unceremoniously, who are you? So what I'm bringing up here is when, when Q started spreading these so-called Q drops and, and coming up with phrases where, where we go one, where we go all, uh, and these caught on, uh, this has nothing especially to do with the internet. It has to do with the nature of the human mind and how we pick things up and, and latch onto things and spread them around like, like memes. It, 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 the internet didn't cause this. This is just another technology uh, that gives voice to the human voice. So um, getting back to Alice's mushroom, so what's this about making a choice left or right? Uh, both choices create unreality because what is she doing? She's eating from a mushroom that changes her reality and doesn't allow her to be herself. Now she's already in a world fallen down the rabbit hole, so to speak, and, and is not herself, is not in a world which allows her to be herself. Maybe that's the way to put it. She's not the natural Alice. She's in a dream world and, and it's full of, of crazy stuff. So the lesson here is that if you fall into a world where there's choices that are in an unreal situation, all the choices are going to be false. You're going to be too big, too small. You already, in reality, don't fit in because the world is illusory. So if we go to a cult world that makes up a delusional thought system and a delusional belief system to the extreme, unlike the average religion that has worked out a reasonable social connection, um, the, the members become like Alice. They have to adjust to that reality, eating from the information that's there, left or right doesn't matter anymore because the whole thing is unreal. So, so the lesson here is, uh, and even in politics, is the ability to fall into a delusional uh, space about what government is and how it can help people and what it's supposed to do um, the idea of a democracy is to try to make this as reasonable as possible so that most of the people benefit from it. And even the people that don't like government, they will also benefit from it. Unlike cults and unlike QAnon, which becomes very factional and only for the few, the special and the enlightened, um, the world in, in, in a normal democracy is, is, better for, for everybody. That's the idea behind it, a more perfect union. Whereas in you know the, the cult world, you take bites of any side of the mushroom, you're gonna be an unreality because the whole context is an unreality. So yeah, I can play with this and, and create a desk out of a raven and answer an impossible question, but that's because I'm participating in that unreal world. Ravens are not writing desks. So with that, I'll leave it. Uh, thank you for listening and uh, enjoy your day. Bye-bye.